Mr. Sellers, uh, you said something that uh, caught my attention. You said that uh, Brazilians like a challenge, and would you say that the challenge at Kamasari was one of the reasons why it succeeded, that it uh, motivated a, a higher level of engagement on the part of the people responsible for the project? The task was a huge task. Mm -hmm. uh, two years to build an industrial complex in, in 1,600,000 square meter, 250,000 square meter of building, uh, 5,000 employees to hire and to train, 10,000 uh, 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 construction works, 400,000, uh, 400 uh, construction companies to manage. It was really a time. But the motivation uh, created a, a, a mode that it was, at the end, it was not a hard task. Uh, grass being planted, uh, trees growing, it was very fast. Ford has uh, a long history in Brazil particularly. We've been in Brazil for almost 90 years. It's been a long operation. Ford started a turnaround uh, process here in Brazil in the late 90s. And that turnaround process is quite fascinating because of all the planning and the execution of that process that started back in, in the late 90s. And we see the positive results of uh, that effort through this day. It's interesting because it had some very specific pillars where Ford needed to focus its resources, attentions, so we could really move the needle and turn around the business here in Brazil. Number one, it was very important to rejuvenate the brand, the Ford brand, in, in Brazil, so the consumers knew that Ford was the, the old traditional Ford, but a lot different in terms of the product offering and the tune to the market at that point in time. We have brands from all over the world, even brands that are not present in the um, U.S. market, for example, they are present here in Brazil. For example, the Italian, the French, they are very strong here, in addition to the Germans and the Americans and the Koreans and the Japanese, they are all here. Therefore, you need to be competitive, but you need to have a brand that people are willing to, to trust and are willing to invest in that brand. The second one is really understanding the needs of the market, of the consumer, and really offering the products that will resonate with that, that customer. Having the right cost structure from material cost, from a fixed cost, variable cost, labor cost, that's critical. You need to make sure that you understand the affordability of the products in the market. You have a product that can generate the financial results that you need, but the consumer uh, needs to be capable of buying that vehicle. Therefore, having the right cost, it is fundamental. The fourth pillar, and very important, was our distribution network in Brazil. We had a series of Ford uh, dealers throughout the countries that had suffered uh, during the late 90s. And many of them decided to stop selling Ford vehicles in Brazil at that point in time because they were concerned about the ability of the brand delivering what the market was going to require in the future. And some of this, them decided not to sell Ford product products any longer. Some of them had very old facilities that really did not convey the confidence on the brand that the consumer would be looking for. Therefore, there was a significant work in terms of addressing our distribution network in Brazil. And the fifth pillar that was really important, aligned with all of that, was really around people, not only from a technical knowledge point of view. The technical knowledge is critical, it's fundamental, it's needed, but is having the right people from a behavior point of view as well. People who are able uh, to, of working together, uh, not being so concerned about functional chimneys. Mm -hmm. They have their own functional responsibility they have to deliver, but they have to look for the good of the company. As part of that strategy, one of the decisions that was made was to start a new manufacturing footprint mm -hmm. where we could launch some of the, our new products in a brand new manufacturing footprint that could bring state-of-the-art technology 
well balanced with the environmental uh, concerns that we knew would be something that Brazil would be worried about in five or ten years in the future. So we could develop a state-of-the-art plant with the best technologies, with the most efficient, efficient manufacturing processes that could build those new vehicles, but also taking, taking care of the environment. And that, that's the way the Camasari uh, footprint was added to the Ford footprint in South America. Back in the uh, early 80s, we used to have basically primarily three plants in Brazil. We used to have an assembly plant here in the city of São Bernardo in São Paulo. We used to have a truck assembly plant here in the city of São Paulo as well. And we used to have an engine plant, engine and transmission plant in a city uh, about an hour and a half from São Paulo called Taubaté. And that was our manufacturing footprint. In that longer term vision, we said there are a lot of opportunities. One of the things we did was we integrated the truck plant with the car plant here in San Bernardo. Basically from two plants, we bring everything together and uh, brought all the assembly of uh, cars and heavy trucks in one site here in San Bernardo. We kept investing on our engine and transmission plant in Taubaté and we started to build the new plant in the northeastern part of the country in a city called Camasari uh, in the state of uh, Bahia, very close to Salvador, that is the capital of the, of the state of Bahia. When we, we decided to build the plant in Bahia, really there was no background in automotive industry, although they have a, a one big industrial petrochemical complex uh, around the, the, the site, there was no automotive industry. Uh, also, uh, when we went there, we had to train uh, more than 5,000 employees when up to the, to the full production. We could not disrupt any industry as an agreement with the government. We could not do high head hunting uh -huh. uh, in other industry because we were going to create a major uh, problem for the region. Uh, 5,000 in hiring. And we started basically with partnership with local universities, partnership with local schools, technical schools, in uh, shaping what we're going to need in terms of technical knowledge in the long run and start training the people that would receive extensive training before they even started to assemble the first vehicle, understand not only the, the technology, the vehicles, the processes, but understand the philosophy in terms of our manufacturing processes that are going to be needed to produce this uh, very advanced type of product. A lot of uh, training on the Ford production system because Ford production system at the end turns this all very simple. Uh, we, we have the, the coordinator, the, the work groups, and they have key objectives to achieve. F number one, safety, quality, delivery, cost, morale, team morale, and environment objectives. So this, uh, the FPS, the Ford Production System, turns this a very simple uh, administrative tool. And we did succeed. We were developing people that were working in supermarket, in uh, car washer, gas station, uh, people from high school, people from a university in the region. Uh, most of them was first job. And we, we did, we opened 350 hours pre-high training for all employees, for all, everybody that want to work for Ford or for the suppliers that were inside the industrial complex. After the hiring selection, this employer had to go through a 900 hours training. And uh, to support that, we built a pilot plant and a training center in the middle of the construction site, right in the middle. I still remember the, the dedication was one year, two months uh, after the, the earth moving start. It was November 17, 2000. And uh, uh, we put all the employees to do training in the pilot plant, a half of these 900 hours. And the other half was in the plant on the job training. So when we launched the, the, the vehicle, uh, although they w it was first job for some of the employees, uh, first time in an industry, 
uh, they were very well trained and we had a very good uh, quality and safety metric at the launch that was really important for us. The Bahia State w had a very good economical situation to support the, the Ford project in terms of incentives, in terms of financing, in terms of infrastructure uh, availability. And they were working together. It was government plus Ford plus 27 suppliers. The government was on board from day one. They have been great partners all along. They see the social impact, positive impact of that operation in the entire region. I mean, they see the purchasing power of the population working uh, in the area, growing year over year. I mean, in the complex today, between Ford and our partners, our suppliers, we have almost uh, 10,000 people operating directly and indirectly providing service. Just on the site, there's about 9,000 people. But on the satellite operations and service, there are a lot of other service providers, a lot of people directly responsible for this operation. Therefore, there are 10,000 families that have seen their purchasing power to grow. They can afford to buy a new house, to buy new cars, and obviously offer better education to their kids. The quality of the education has increased. The quality of life for the people in that region has increased, and the government sees that. They see the benefit, and they see it as a successful project. And what the company decided to do is working with the local government is really to create this infrastructure. We have a privately owned port where we have uh, ships bringing vehicles or exporting vehicles uh, or parts, if that's the case, that is managed, is owned by and managed by Ford. The Salvador port, the capital city of Bahia State, Salvador, and it's 50 kilometers away from the industrial complex. Uh, we do have good roads to access the site, but not that good, uh, and we were going to spend too much of money to duplicate roads and to expand the Salvador port. So the decision was to implement a new port, private port for Ford, in a city called Candeias that is 30 kilometers uh, from the industrial complex. It's the, uh, the success of our logistics. The stamp is not, was not Ford. Uh, the body shop was shared between Ford and another company. The paint shop was Ford. But in the final assembly building, you have Ford that is responsible for the vehicle assembly. All the rest, the module, is somebody else assembling. We have uh, seven suppliers in one side of the chassis assembly line. And seven or eight suppliers in the other side of the trim line. Uh, so these suppliers are inside the Ford roof with no fences inside the roof, only safety uh, painting aisles. Uh, and, they, and they have to produce in the sequence that Ford is producing. Mm -hmm. So we have to share the production scheduling with them. We have to share all the changes that we have to make based on, on, on changes required in the paint shop. We have to share with them. They have to do quick changeovers and follow the, the Ford pace. Having the suppliers work with us right on the site, we have an immediate feedback process where whenever we, ha we see something out of uh, control, we can immediately react to our suppliers, correct and avoid having a long pipeline of problems or issues that eventually generate a lot of waste and a lot of uh, problems for, for our own manufacturing. One thing that uh, we, we did that is the sharing of uh, infrastructure and services. Uh, some services are shared per square meter of utilization inside the industrial complex. Some services are shared uh, based on the level of employment, number of employees. Uh, some services are sh uh, shared based on consumption. There's a Brazil log in one side and the, the company log in the other side. But they all have the same color uniform, uh, the same uh, compensation policy. Medical service is only one. Cafeteria is only one. The entrance is only one. They are, by the way, they are inside the fence. We launched the plant first 
uh, with uh, a very low volume product an existing product that we already had but it was a way of starting to produce something and at the same time train the people then right after that we started uh, launching the new products we launched the new fiesta hatch the five door fiesta we launched the four door fiesta sedan right after and then we launched the eco sport and the eco sport it's, it's a great success story in the automotive world because it's a small SUV built on a B-car platform that came in the Brazilian market in the 2003 time frame when there was absolutely nobody producing SUVs in Brazil. And uh, the EcoSport came as, uh, and became pretty much the benchmark in terms of uh, white space product innovation and bringing something that the consumer was expecting but he didn't know he, he needed and and we could bring that product and EcoSport was a success from day one not only in Brazil but uh, throughout Latin America we started to build the uh, EcoSport in Camasari exporting that vehicle producing for the Brazilian market but exporting that vehicle throughout uh, South America including exports to Mexico as well and the vehicle was a hit in every single market and that sequence of new products is being pretty consistent from 2004, 2005, 6, 7 we've been introducing new products and we keep the brand always uh, delivering the new trends of the market delivering a good financial equation for Ford Motor Company and for our dealers as well. Over time, we decided to develop a product development center or to install a product development center right in our complex. And uh, today, Ford in Brazil has about uh, 1,200 uh, professionals, engineers, working in product development alone. And out of those 1,200 professionals working in Brazilian product development alone, about 70% of them are in the Camasari complex. Then evolved from just an assembly plant, a manufacturing plant, to a, a full-fledged uh, manufacturing site with product development right there. Today we have engineers doing all, all um, areas of product development from electrical to chassis to interiors going right there. We have a design studio right there that is responsible for taking care of the, the vehicles for South America. Therefore, we added a lot more value mm -hmm. than the just traditional build a plant, bring parts from whatever and assemb assemble a vehicle and ship to whatever. No, we basically added value all the way to the value chain, including product development to offer a better business case. We planted in the region more than 250,000 trees in, in, in the whole region with a longer term vision of doing the right thing for the environment as well. We have the RTO that is a regenerative thermal oxidizer uh, treatment for all the, the fumes from the paint shop. Uh, that I think was the first plant in Brazil to implement that. Uh, we installed one of the first water-based painting systems in Brazil in our new plant in Bahia mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the same time we develop a wetlands um, type of environmental process that could take care of all the water that was being discharged by our operations through this wetland process that we could either reutilize water in, in, the, in the manufacturing process or it could use to take care of the environment in, in the region as well. For an industry you see, oh we could put uh, a treatment plant, mm -hmm. no, we, we were going to give example because if we can treat the sanitary waste for 5,000 employees, any city in the region could do the same and the investment was very, very small. But when you build that in your strategy from day one, it doesn't add cost, it really saves you money on the long run. And that was the philosophy when the plan was being developed for Camasari, to have uh, an environmental plant that would make it self-sustainable on the long run, that would make us do the right thing for the local communities that we were operating, 
and at the same time making sure our costs in the long run were going to be more competitive. Ideally, and, and Ford is working uh, very hard on that and very focused on that, ideally we want to find global platforms that can be developed in one place and that can be tailored to specific requirements of different markets around the world. Mm -hmm. Obviously we don't want to develop a new platform in every single country or every single region of the world because it's not cost efficient, it's, it's not uh, engineering efficient really. And what we, we are working on as a company, on having this global footprint that Ford has, footprint of manufacturing, footprint of sales, and footprint of uh, product development, of uh, assigning certain platforms to different uh, centers of engineering around the world, where those centers of engineering are responsible for developing that platform, that product for different markets. The vehicle may be assembled in their own region, but can be assembled in another region, but the engineering is, gonna be, is being done once, mm -hmm. and then it's tailored to the specific needs of different parts of the world. And that evolved from this strategy with Kamasari, where we did not have a platform that was, at that point in time, fully developed and suited for the local needs. We had to do that point in time. As we evolved, our strategy evolved as well. And today, we have the centers of engineering of Ford around the world focusing on certain platforms and certain vehicle solutions for other markets. For example, we have our engineering center in Kamasari responsible for de developing a next generation vehicles, not only for Latin America, but developing this next generation of vehicles that we're working on for Latin America and for markets in Asia Pacific as well. And again, develop once and apply and tailor to the needs of different parts of the world as well. Last month I went to UK and I saw in one table there, wa there was at least 10 Brazilians and three of them were from Bahia, Baianos, in UK, at product development in UK. So th this is really motivates. So there's always something else to do. One lesson that I am learning from listening to you is that in Brazil and maybe elsewhere, the way to succeed is to set very high targets, very high goals, to set challenges and people sure. rise up to me. Sure. Yeah. The more we have challenges, the more we can create motivation. Ford is a, it's a big business, uh, the automotive business, really complex. But uh, when you see the teamwork, we, I think we are, every day we are faster and faster on taking decisions on assigning the responsibility and on empowering people. From the government, from the federal government to the state government, our suppliers, our partners who went there with us, the, the local educational institutions from high school to the college participating with us, obviously the own efforts of uh, Ford Motor Company working with that. And then at the end, this is on a regional and local base, but then at the end, partnering, partnering with our dealers as well to be able to have the right distribution channel for our products. And everybody played a key role. And I tell you, if one of the stakeholders were not willing to participate, it would have been very difficult to make it work. But it was so much better than we, we ever thought about it that we had to increase capacity in the plant years ahead of what we had planned to. As a matter of fact, in our original plan, we had planned the plant for a capacity of operating up to three shifts of operation. And our vision is that we probably would go to about two years uh, of op uh, two shifts of operation within a three or four years time frame. Or well, the reality is in about four years, we needed three full shifts. And we've been running the Kamasari plant at almost 100% its capacity since 2004, 2005 time frame. Now it's 2009, we're continuing to fully utilize that plant with great products, well received in the market, and delivering what the consumer needs.